no. Okay, you can go for it. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I also want to thank the, uh, the organizers and PSI in general. Very, very interesting week so far. And I've already learned quite a few things, which I think I might want to try out when I go back home. Uh, my name is Vijay. I uh, work in the, I'm part of the newly created scientific computing group. Um, in the photon science division at the German electron synchrotron. Can you hear me in the back? Oh, hey, you want this? Okay, well, we kept it on now. You can go no, the it's fine. I can just shout now. You only speak now. No, okay. I'll just shout back. It's okay. You didn't miss much. I just said hello. Um, <laughs> right. So I want to talk about, well, I want to pick up from where Kate left off. She talked about uh, automating data collection. And I want to hop over um, one step downstream and talk about. Uh, automating data processing. And what I really want to talk about actually is uh, making data processing easier for, for our beam line users. And I also want to find out how to go to the next slide. Yes. Um, so just to, to set the stage, right? The, the way things work now, the typical user workflow we have um, at the moment, at DAISY at least, is that users come um, to the beam line and they have very limited time at the beam time at the beam line. So their main focus is take, take, take data because they don't want to miss out on, um, on uh, yeah, anything interesting, right? So they, they acquire as much as they can and then they typically <laughs> just schlep terabytes of well, hard disks uh, worth terabytes of data back to their home institute or download it from the web portal. And then they start analyzing the data, right? Uh, to verify if things are okay. Uh, but what's important is at this point, there's no uh, real possibility to do uh, any more acquisition, right? So we want to move from this kind of workflow to, uh, to what I show on the right side, where data analysis becomes um, an inbuilt part of, um, of, of the user experience at the beamline. So the users acquire data, <coughs> excuse me, and the data is immediately analyzed so that the users can verify uh, looking at the analysis results, whether the data that, that they've acquired looks okay, if they need to make any adjustments, <coughs> if they need to make any adjustments to their experiment setup, if they need to uh, tweak their samples to the next scan and so on. So, that's, that's the idea. We want to move uh, to, to getting this red box ready for the users. And the way we do it um, at the moment uh, is through what we call Mento. It's just a bunch of, uh, of, of Python modules, which the users can, can plug in to, to their data acquisition recipes. And this sits inside the control software at the beamline. And it's triggered automatically by the control software when the data acquisition pipeline runs. So the analysis is triggered at the beamline and run uh, at the um, at a remote node on the HPC cluster um, at the facility, right? And the idea is that this runs during data acquisition. And the motivation behind this is to make analyzing data easy or invisible for the user. And more importantly, Make, make the boring bits, well, from the user's perspective, the boring, the irrelevant bits uh, invisible. And there's actually quite a few uh, boring bits um, for the user. Uh, this is just, I just want to illustrate, this is the computing infrastructure landscape at the facility, right, at Daisy. And the, the, the beamline world and the, it, the core computing uh, universe, these are two completely separate uh, worlds, right? So there's there's very clear separation between what happens at the beamline and what happens on the compute cluster. And there's no access. Beamlines run functional accounts, which don't have access to the HPC cluster. The HPC nodes cannot see what's being written at the beamline during a beam time, right? So Mentor comes in and tries to, um, to straddle these two worlds, right? So there's a bunch of things which I'm not gonna go through now, but uh, there's a bunch of um, uh, these boxes here, which all come together um, inside Mento, right? You hook into the controls uh, software at one point, you 
follow the pointers to where the data is going to appear at the, at the cluster. You take care of credentialing authentication. You get a temporary access to tunnel through this wall to get access to the cluster. And you also have a sort of poor man's queue, job cure to make sure you wait for the data to, to appear in the cluster while running uh, and then run your analysis. No, so Mentor solves these, these nitty gritties um, while trying to keep all this essentially opaque um, from the user's uh, perspective, right? So the user doesn't see um, the things that I mentioned on the left, which comprise Mentor, but we try to make it, uh, we try to compress all that into essentially a three-step process for the user. So if I'm a user coming to the Beamline and uh, want to write my acquisition recipe, all I need to do is get the package, uh, yeah, essentially create this trigger saying, I want to trigger my analysis on, in this case, in this example, uh, using Slurm, could be a local trigger where then I could use it for visualization, for example, right? And then just say, this is the program I want to run for my analysis, and these are the parameters I want to, uh, to use. So this, um, this is essentially to hide all the complexity uh, from the user, right? And while this three-step process looks like it's uh, it's very rigid in the sense that it only works for a certain type of uh, of DAQ recipe or a certain type of macro, uh, what we found is the beamlines that do use it um, at Daisy uh, are very different. These two beamlines that I'm showing here couldn't be more different. Right? So one P10 is the coherence beamline at Daisy, and P11 is the macromolecular crystallography beamline, and uh, uh, they, they have widely different workflows, right? The one uses very standard off-the-shelf controls, components, Tango, Sadana. The MX Beamline has an, an in-house control software. XPCS Beamline uses custom um, uh, analysis programs written that run on the GPU. The MX Beamline has the classic XDS uh, family of uh, programs to run their analysis. The computing infrastructure looks very different for, for, for each of them. The, the XPCS, the coherence beamline uses the standard DAISY HPC pool uh, with shared resources and so on. The MX beamline has dedicated nodes and uh, yeah, has complete access, uh, exclusive access to, to their own purchase nodes and so on. Even visualizing the analysis results looks very different. Uh, P10 does local uh, visualization. Typically, they used to do this with, uh, well, they still do it with, uh, with MATLAB, looking at the analysis results. Now we've written a, a Qt-based um, visualizer uh, using Silex. By the way, uh, me and my colleagues, we used to call this Silx um, at Daisy. And earlier this week, I heard um, someone from ESRF mention Silex. So just for this, it's already been worth it coming to know about So that was useful. So we are, yeah. So, Thanks for the Silex uh, um, team. I mean, thanks to the Silex team. It's really nice. It's very uh, quick to get up and running with this. Anyway, so yeah, so that's the that's the that's the context, right? Very different beamlines. Managed to use Mento um, <coughs> despite having different combinations of custom and standard uh, set of procedures, right? So that's that's where we are now. The the beamlines that do use it uh, actually don't say anything. Don't give any feedback if they don't see any of this uh, happening, right? So once these three lines go into their DAQ and their, for instance, in a Sadana macro, then any user coming in and just running the macro has no idea what's happening, right? Um, the, the only feedback they get is uh, here. So on the left, I'm, it's just a screenshot of the Beamline control terminal. And the only feedback the user gets is that online ana analysis is being triggered while data is being acquired. So this is, some sort of 2D scan. And what I want to uh, point out is that the scan is running. And on the right-hand side uh, is a screen, it's just me running top on, on an HPC node at the same time, right? So analysis is running at the same time uh, while the scan is still going on. So the idea is to be quick enough to, um, to give back results from points that you've scanned already while your scan uh, hasn't finished yet, right? So that's, uh, that's the idea of running these two uh, simultaneously. And just illustrating what it looks like at the moment, uh, this is just the, the XPCS uh, analysis results. One useful thing that comes out of Mentor is that 
you get quick feedback on what your experiment setup does and if it looks okay. So just basic first order data processing, right? So here you can uh, just check if your setup looks okay, the intensities look okay, the beam stop is in the right place maybe. So these sort of things where you might want to uh, uh, be informed if something something needs to change in your setup, right? So that's that's one useful thing, but it's not just these first order sort of processing uh, pipelines that we support. P10 also, so the coherence beamline also does um, the full blown analysis or multiple analysis pipelines through Mento. And these are really the, the final results uh, with correlation uh, curves and, um, and so on, which are really ready for publication for them. Maybe the plots don't look so nice, but the results behind the plots are actually the results that they use for publication. So the idea is really to be able to do full analysis and full um, um, feedback from the data that they are acquiring at the moment for them to be able to uh, decide whether the experiment's going well, whether they need to, um, to change their setup or um, whether they need to store the data that they uh, have been taking uh, at the moment, which is a very important point actually. Storage is one of the most expensive things. Uh, so that's the that's the um, that's the way things stand now. The, the 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 next the immediate next steps that we're looking at is to 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 do all the things that uh, I mentioned now while the data is in flight. Really, so at the moment the data gets written down and uh, then Mentor picks up the data uh, from the cluster and so on. And this is yeah hangups from. Uh, historical reasons at Daisy why these two things are separate, a different file systems and so on. But the idea is that we want to move to a paradigm where we avoid letting data hit disk, right? Because when data hits disk, it's never going out. So this, this will stay. So we want to avoid the situation. We want to process data in flight. And uh, Daisy IT has now provided a, uh, a data streaming middleware so the idea for us now would be, so at the moment Mentor sits here after the data acquisition is done and uh, runs through the data. But the idea would be then to move over here and sit after the, the streaming middleware so that we can just look at data as it comes through the wire and, um, and try to do, yeah, essentially streaming based analysis, right? And from what I've uh, already seen earlier this week, this probably also means we can use um, some things that people have uh, done already, maybe use Nexus writers that exist already and have uh, our own analysis modules that can hopefully be shared across beam lines. So that's, that's, the, that's the immediate uh, future that I see for, 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 for mentors. Uh, looking more, um, towards the, the short, medium and longer term. Uh, another thing that would be interesting in addition to, to having a sort of streaming analysis framework is to have um, e better visualizers for, for the analysis results. So uh, we've seen a lot of talks which use uh, web frameworks for, for essentially showing everything. So it's be it GUIs or be plotting results, be it, um, yeah, just the interface to users seems to be moving towards uh, web-based framework. So that would be uh, something that, um, the direction that we would uh, consider uh, taking, right? And while we're dreaming, another thing that would be really nice is to, to have a sort of a replay button, which not only allows the user to, to redo the analysis uh, with a different set of parameters, but also in some sense to re play the data. So the entire uh, pipe gets rerun. So the data, if it's stored on disk, gets picked up, streamed again through uh, uh, the pipe. And then we again run analysis on, while the data is in flight. And uh, the, hopefully if it's fast enough, it's cheap for the user to do this, which means they might try different uh, sets of analysis parameters and different types of analyses on there data that they've just acquired, which we hope leads them to not store raw data 
long term. Right? I know some of the solutions that facilities have gone for is to introduce data policies. Um, so the, the factor by which you reduce the time that you allow the users to store raw data is the factor by which you reduce your, your budget, right, in tens of millions. Uh, so yeah, so data policy is one direction, and this I think would be uh, another interesting direction to take to encourage users to to not store raw data long term if they know they don't need it, right? So that's the idea. So I think with these kind of uh, ideas, Mentor is in pretty good shape and hopefully gets better with uh, with data streaming. But better user group software still means that Mentor's is bugs, right? So uh, the idea was that now having uh, heard about um, new things like web frameworks, new things like Nexus writers that are already available and um, all these um, discussions that we've been having together. I think there's new opportunities to make mentors uh, really no buts. So that's, uh, that's it. That's all I wanted to say today. I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. This one up there already, then one here, and then one here. Okay. Uh, this is important to me. Yeah. Um, earlier on your side, we had sort of the P9 uh, side of things and then the next one. Right. I was just wondering if when you do this real time sort of data analysis, if you put any fruits on the or any real requirements on the application, and if so, um, could you have very specific several processes going on at once about sort of what they do? Yeah, so this, this is actually not a simple question. This is a trick question because this is exactly what we uh, face. And this is something that we've seen can be um, a pain. Some of the analysis we run um, runs on GPU nodes exclusively, right? So then you have to ask for GPU resource, uh, so GPU um, nodes. You can ask three questions. So, it's true, I can set this under the carpet, but there is a way to the resources that the analysis expects. My one outdated shirt picks different nodes in the cluster. The way it works, at least, is when you get a node, you get full access, so exclusive access to the node. So throttling is sort of solved by asking for a bigger pool of nodes when you want, when you know in advance. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not the best solution. We are considering things like asking users to predict what their compute needs would be when they apply for beam times. Not really sure this is the best way to go because most of the time the, user don't, the users don't know uh, what kind of compute needs they have, right? So yeah, it's a tricky, it's a tricky uh, part of the process. <coughs> My question is uh, goes in a similar direction. Um, you have to make sure that the analysis queue is set up. How yes. Do you yeah. So Mentor has yeah. This is what I meant meant by a poor man's queue. So Mentor has this uh, queue where it's a queue before submitting to say in this case to the Slurm queue. So Slurm maintains its own yeah. job queue, and Mentor holds off and keeps track of uh, the analysis jobs that are being triggered by the GEQ system before submitting it to Slum. There are things that Mentor needs to make sure because of the fact that these two are completely separate, Mentor needs to make sure that, they, that, the, that the data is visible in the cluster when the job is queued. Depending on the, the job profile, you might want to run several jobs on the same node or wait and queue, say, only two jobs or three jobs at a time, wait for them to finish, and then queue the next three jobs. So these things are sort of done by, um, by the, the, the queue. It's not a full-blown queue with full control over the resources the way Slurm does. So it's a sort of poor man's version of this queue. And, and then the output is <coughs> written back to GPFS, and it's pick, being picked up by the uh, data acquisition program, or is this a separate? Yeah, so I didn't uh, go into this here, but what uh, you're asking is exactly yeah. what this dotted red line does, right? So this is also a bit of me sweeping things under the carpet because this is not where 
JZIT sees this going long term. This is the solution we have now where the analysis happens uh, at the cluster uh, node and then is written to a temporarily accessible mount point. And the results are then not fed back to the DAQ system, but still visible at the beam line, right? So the results don't go back to the control system, but they are accessible from where the control system runs. So the visualization then happens on the beamline control terminal, but outside of the control pipeline, right? That's why we want to move to this data streaming uh, pipeline because there we would really get rid of this GPFS bit completely and just have everything. Um, well, the middleware now uses MongoDB, so everything will be in a database in any case in the back. Yeah. Is, is, it, is it a short question? Yes, yes. Yeah. there's a Python library called Dask, which does about the same. So did you ever consider to rely on Dask rather than trying to build yourself for a um, Yes, we had a quick look at Dask actually. And um, like you say, it does do a lot of the orchestration work that, uh, that we do by hand. So this is still up for, uh, for discussion. The reason we didn't do this uh, at the moment, at the, at the time, is that uh, IT was already building this streaming pipeline, right? So we wanted to plug into the streaming pipeline and Dask wouldn't play well with, uh, with what we have already in place. So that's essentially the, the main reason. No, no technical reasons for this. Okay, I think we have to take other questions during coffee. I also have lots of questions. <laughs> <Brilliant>. <laughs> and Silex is actually uh, it's, uh, it's inspired by the Stone Age too. That's why. Oh, it's okay. Good to know. And, uh, Jerome wow. is one of the <laughs> namers of the software. Thanks again. Right, thank yeah. you.